Hello class, this is Miss Augustine, and today we are going to start Chapter 11 Notes, and Chapter 11 is about the gas laws. So, in Chapter 10, we learned about kinetic molecular theory, and this little flowchart is just really a concept map showing you that we learned about ideal gases and these are the assumptions for ideal gases. All particles uh, have collisions that are elastic. The energy is proportional to the temperature. The particles are in constant motion. There are no attractive or repulsive forces. There's a large number of particles. The volume of particles is zero. And then we talked about those assumptions are for an ideal gas. But as it turns out, that kinetic theory works very well for real gases. Um, the main difference between an ideal gas and a real gas is that their particles do occupy space, and they do uh, um, exert attractive and repulsive forces on one another. And then, in general, the nature of gases, they're compressible, they diffuse and effuse, actually, they're fluid, their low density, and they expand to fill the container that they're in. And then we talked about this again um, when we were talking about kinetic theory. In general, if you're comparing a gas to a liquid or a solid, you can see that the gas particles are much farther apart than are either those for a liquid or a solid. And here the example um, a gas at STP would occupy uh, 22.4 liters or 22,400 milliliters, and that one mole of water occupies, by comparison, only 18 mils. And if we're talking about a solid like aluminum, one mole of it occupies only 10 milliliters. So again, referring uh, briefly to kinetic molecular theory for an ideal gas, the motion of the particles is random and linear, and the collisions are elastic. By elastic collision, I mean that no energy is lost when the particles are colliding, whether with other particles or whatever container that they encounter. So again, real gases actually do attract, um, ex exhibit attractive forces on one another and repulsive, uh, depending and they do occupy space, and obviously their collisions are not elastic. So what do we need to know to define a gas? And that's what this chapter is really all about. So in order to define a gas, you need its volume in liters or milliliters. You need to know the pressure, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more today, whether it's expressed as atmospheres, kilopascals, or millimeters. Those are all units that we use for pressure and the temperature, and for gases we only express the temperature in Kelvin, and the number of molecules or moles. If you know those four things about a gas, you can pretty much completely define the gas. So we haven't really spent a lot of time talking about the pressure of a gas. It's caused by the collisions in a container. It's evenly distributed due to the randomness of gas particle motion, and pressure is actually defined as the force per unit area. So if you think about pressure that you might have heard about, like if you're measuring the pressure of your air inside of a tire, it's typically PSI, which is pounds per square inch. Pounds are a measure of force, and square inches are area, so that would be a good example. So when did we start measuring pressure? Well, a pressure, me pressure is measured using a device called a barometer, and it was developed by this fellow, uh, Evangelista Torricelli. And what he did was he had a dish with liquid mercury in it. Mercury is a liquid at room temperature. And he put a column, glass column, upside down in it. And he noticed that the height of the mercury in the column changed from day to day, and he uh, figured out correctly 
that the force of atmospheric pressure on the surface of the mercury is what's causing it to climb up the column. And at sea level, standard atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Why millimeters? Well, it turns out that um, Europeans use the metric system. If you go on the Weather Channel today or any day and pull up what the pressure is, you'll see that in the United States of America, pressure is measured in inches of mercury instead of millimeters of mercury. So again, that's just the metric system versus the English system. So again, another picture of measuring pressure. We don't typically have dishes of mercury laying around anymore, um, but again, this would be a tube that was a vacuum tube, empty space, and again, a dish of mercury, and again, measuring the height, and again, the weight of the mercury in the column um, is affected by the atmospheric pressure, and as pressure is pushing down, we actually measure the height of the column. So we're going to talk about the different units. So the units of pressure that we typically use in a science classroom are one atmosphere for standard pressure, and these are all indicating what standard pressure is. So one of the units that we use is the atmosphere. An atmosphere is defined as Six, uh, 760 millimeters of mercury, so 1 atm is the same as 760 millimeters of mercury. Um, sometimes you'll see it written as 760 tor. 1 millimeter of mercury is defined as a tor for Evangelista Torricelli, who figured all this good stuff out. The System International unit for pressure is of course different because it would be too easy if it was the same and the SI unit is the Pascal. One atmosphere is equivalent to 101,325 Pascals. So to make life easier we divide by a thousand and call it a kilopascal or kPa. So the equivalent units are one atmosphere, which is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. You can also call them 760 tor of mercury for Torricelli. And that is also equivalent to 101.325 kilopascals. So that was all I wanted to talk about for today. And then we're going to talk about a worksheet that helps us convert pressure units. This is Ms. Augustine signing off for today.